Perfect. Bye. Okay, perfect. So thank you again for, for having us, Philippe, and also to the BSA for inviting us to present these projects. Uh, today we have, again, I'm Victor Perez I'm an assistant professor at the Toronto Metropolitan University. And today we have with us uh, Leora Klein, Master in Urban Development, uh, Francis Grout Brown, Master in Urban Development, and also Sam Kassula, uh, Master in Urban Development as well. Um, just a short introduction of what um, everyone is going to be talking about. Um, the projects or the presentation is called Aging Together, uh, together with a TO capital, because that's basically Toronto, where we're we coming from but uh, together as well, because uh, we are all in, uh, come, uh, going to together um, in, the, in this journey. So understanding the spatial manifestation of aging in place and aging inclusivity in architectural and urban context is fundamental to creating future intergenerational cities. Uh, so this project will explore through the following projects, different ways to provide inclusive housing for older adults in four different multi-generational demographics. Um, the first part of the presentation by Leora and Francis showcases a project called Fusion. It's a winning submission for the Urban Land Institute Gerald Hines International Student Urban Design Competition in Kansas City. This affordable mixed use development was designed around two key, two key pillars, connectivity and resilience. And the project, project's pivotal piece is an iconic community center with housing for older adults, contributing to an inclusive multi-generational space that brings people together. And then the second part of the presentation by Sam Casola will address solutions for the lack of inclusive multi-generational housing for 2S LGBTQI plus in uh, demographics in Toronto, especially those that identify as queer, trans, or two-spirited. Uh, this project will frame how heteronormative ideals of relationships and family functioning have influenced the development of housing opportunities and services for older adults. Um, and this presentation can be no more on point because today it is the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia. So I'm really excited that this uh, happened exactly as well uh, for uh, the talk for today. So with that said, I will leave the floor to Francis and Leora first, and then we'll go with them. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Victor. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and then just confirm that everyone can see the presentation. Good. Yes, yes we're good. We can go see ahead. It. Awesome. All right. Okay, so yeah, so good evening and thanks again so much for having us. Uh, so my name is Leora and I'm here with uh, Francis. And as Victor said, we've just completed our master's in urban planning. Um, and we had this really unique opportunity while we were completing our master's to kind of plan this hypothetical development as part of a uh, student design competition. So ultimately, um, we looked to develop this a site that you know, attracted people of all ages to live and use the space and age together. And that's, uh, you know, what we're here to speak to today. Um, so we threw together a quick agenda just to provide an overview, overview of what we're looking to cover. Um, we'll start off with just a bit of context on the competition and our team, and then we'll speak to the site that we created. Um, you know, we'll speak to our vision and aspirations for creating a diverse and inclusive and sustainable community and how we brought those to life in all different aspects. Um, throughout the site from, you know, housing to public space to urban agriculture. Um, and what was neat, I guess, about this experience is that a design competition that was, you know, hypothetical really allowed us to be aspirational and let our ideas and creativity run wild and what kind of could be for how, you know, people live and age together. Um, but it is worth noting that our design was paired with a pro forma. So we were considering all the financial implications of our decision throughout the process to help really keep us grounded in reality. Um, so I'll fly through this, but just wanted to provide a bit of context on the competition. I think the most notable thing to mention is that the competition was entirely hypothetical um, and it was only two weeks long. So though there was a ton of thought and detail that went into this, we were very limited in our timing. Uh, the competition is run by the Urban Land Institute and each year they choose a really large underutilized site to be redeveloped. Um, and th this uh, for this competition, the site was in Kansas City, Missouri. 
it was about 16 acres of parking lot in the downtown core and it really posed an incredible development opportunity. Uh, the objectives that they gave us were quite broad. Um, it really gave us space to explore what the site could uh, be. They essentially just asked for a site that had a catalytic vision. It you know, had the ability to provide a positive economic impact in both a local and regional context. They were looking for it to enable sustainability and resilience and you know, enable equity and provide affordable housing. And they also wanted us to consider the future of transportation as a part of it. Um, so each team was made up of a collection of students from different schools across Toronto and different programs. Um, our group included students from planning, uh, design, architecture, and MBA students. And the diverse group really helped to mimic, you know, a real world development context where you have all different consultants and specialists working together to learn from each other along the way. Um, and I'll pass it over to Francis to introduce you uh, to our team. Thanks, Leigh. Um, so <clears throat> there were five of us on the team. Uh, Leora and I studied at the Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly known as Ryerson University, and we studied urban development. Uh, Ro Tian and Chenny studied urban design and architecture at the University of Toronto, and then Yen Lin uh, studied real estate and infrastructure at York University. And we were supported by a really great group of advisors, one of whom is Victor Perez Amato, who's on the call today. So uh, thank you again, Victor. Next slide. Just to give some quick context uh, to the site, just to show where we started from. So this was a fairly large site, um, 25 parcels of land across eight city blocks. As Leora mentioned, it was about approximately 16 acres of which the majority was surface parking lots, as you can see from the photo. Um, we had to design around the affordable housing development that you can see kind of right there in the center. And then there was a small seniors home just to the north that we also had some flexibility with in terms of how to incorporate it into our design and what we wanted to do with the site. Um, we looked at a lot of different demographics in the surrounding areas. And the one on the right is just to show you the age distribution uh, between Kansas City as a whole and then the greater downtown area. So just to note the most significant age group by far in the downtown area is 25 to 35 years old. This age group um, has, de has increased by 45% since the 1980s in the downtown area, whereas the aging adult population in the downtown area has decreased uh, during that same time. And Kansas City's older adult population, which they categorize as 65 years and older, is expected to nearly double uh, over the next 20 years, showing a significant need for um, that population. And the last thing to note is just the site is located next to a major highway that kind of loops around the entire downtown area. So this site is quite significant in that it's the kind of symbolic edge of the downtown core. And next slide. So this is just um, a photo of the site looking kind of east towards downtown. Next slide. Just to briefly go over uh, kind of the grounding design concepts, we wanted to ground it in uh, connectivity. So how to better physically connect to the areas around it, but also how to connect into the surrounding social networks and demographics. And then the second grounding concept was um, resilience. So not only in terms of environmental, but also economic. Um, in the bottom left hand corner you'll see a main feature was a pedestrian spine that runs across the entire site. So this made public space a key feature of the site and gave us lots of room to play with in terms of different spaces for different demographics. And then just to the right, um, you'll notice a small kind of red square in the in the. Um, yeah, in the map there. And this is a major transit center that connects regionally. So we really wanted to focus on linking affordable housing with transit accessibility. And then in the top right hand corner, um, you'll see that a major component that I think stood out for our proposal was its social element. So really using infrastructure to connect the site to the social context of its um, surroundings and also to the city's history. Uh, next slide. Lee. So this is what our ultimate site plan looked like. Um, and as Francis alluded to, it was really, our focus was enabling, you know, the social and physical connectivity through access to transit uh, over here, connection to the surrounding communities and providing mixed income housing throughout the site. And we also really look to enable economic and environmental resilience through supporting 
um, local business on the site, creating jobs and supporting the local food system and really just building sustainably with the future in mind. Um, so we'll just call out a couple key features um, on the site. So uh, the pedestrian spine, which Francis already spoke to, um, this was kind of lined to fine grain retail and public realm elements to help really bring the, the site together and create a, a gathering space um, that kind of accommodated people of all ages. Um, so all the buildings essentially contained a mix of uses. There was typically retail at grade with residential or office above. Um, this area over here was our urban agriculture uh, hub, which included urban farms, a research center, and a restaurant incubation space. This urban agriculture theme was deeply rooted in Kansas City's um, history in agriculture. And there's also was a really strong uh, community network of urban agriculture there that already existed to plug into uh, to help serve a lot of nearby food deserts that were very prevalent in the surrounding areas. Um, a key piece of social infrastructure was the community center, which included seniors housing, which was a key feature uh, of our site that we'll speak to um, in a bit more depth later on. And uh, overall, you know, the site was well connected to transit. We just added bike lanes um, and the pedestrian spine to really enhance the mobility options uh, available and uh, support more active transportation. So that was more notable here and here. Um, so before we dive into specifics on our site, we just wanted to highlight some of the principles that informed our vision of aging together and, you know, creating a community of people of all ages, incomes, and abilities. Um, so there's kind of three key principles that we anchored uh, to. The first one was just, you know, trying to consider the micro level details that would enable aging in place. So we didn't really have a chance to explore this in depth due to timing, but something that we researched and thought about was how we might design living spaces that would grow with someone as they age. So for example, you know, wider hallways and doorways um, for people with different accessibility needs and varied room arrangements to accommodate you know, evolving family structures. Um, the second key principle was about creating com communal spaces that enabled interaction and really just tried to decrease social is isolation both inside and outside. So within the residential buildings and within the public realm as well. And then that another kind of principle that, that ties into that was about creating spaces that enabled intergenerational interaction and programming um, and just really creating contact between people of all ages. So, you know, we really wanted to create an environment that reduced age segregation, increased social connections, um, really improved community infrastructure, led to better individual health and well being, and decreased social isolation and loneliness. Um, and so I'll pass it back to Frankie to get into the specifics of how we reflected those principles in our site design. Uh, so we chose to combine a community center and seniors housing to really make this an intergenerational space. So uh, there's rental housing units for seniors that are spread across the three floors, um, kind of on the left above the, the community center. Um, we wanted to make sure there's opportunities for seniors to connect with the amenities and also the social dynamics in the downtown core, while also still having kind of a healthier neighborhood feel there. And in terms of aging together, our main areas were one, uh, multi-generational programming. So we included rooftop gardens in the seniors housing area um, to act as a stormwater management tool, but also a placemaking tool for the seniors living there. This can provide a more peaceful area while still living in the downtown core, but also act as a space um, to hold programming between uh, those living there, but also youth that come to the community center. There's also a daycare within the community center, so that can also offer programming between seniors and young children, like storytelling, book readings, um, so different activities like that. And in terms of social inclusivity and and health. Um, there are multiple amenities that the seniors have easy access to, a community theater, classrooms, a library, a multi-sports facility. So these spaces can support the health of aging residents while also being a space for, for when friends and family come to visit. There's also activities that, that can be done together. 
Um, we placed this uh, community center close to the major transit station. So this is to increase public transit accessibility for those living there, but also again, for friends and family visiting, which can help to decrease the isolation um, from friends and family, but also from the rest of the city itself. And then lastly, uh, we had an affordable housing strategy across the entire site that we'll get to um, in a couple of minutes, which was about 30% of affordable housing units. Um, that was targeted at 50% of average median income as per the Kansas City housing policies. So this same strategy was used for the specific uh, seniors housing units within this complex. And then the last thing I'll say about this building was um, the downtown area plan in Kansas City really emphasize the use of gateways to communicate entry into a distinct area. So we really wanted to use this as the structure that kind of is the first thing that people see when they enter downtown um, to really communicate the community oriented nature of the site and to really help bridge inside and outside of the highway loop that really separates the neighboring area to the downtown core. Uh, next slide. So we also uh, were trying to consider aging together in the context of public space, um, how its design can offer a lot of areas, not only for the seniors living nearby to sit and relax, but also interact with uh, different demographics. We had a large um, pedestrian focus with the spine that we mentioned that runs across the site. Um, so this creates more easy and safe access to the amenities across the site. It acts as a traffic calming measure it creates a more intimate um, neighborhood feel, better wheelchair and walker accessibility. So there's no train grading. And we also separated the bike lane from the pedestrian spaces. Um, and we tried to really incorporate different placemaking opportunities that can be really flexible and adaptable to different demographics, but also to different seasons throughout the year. We had, for example, we had um, a parking garage that we used the side of it uh, to act as a um, area to project movies or sports viewings with different seating already incorporated on uh, the side of the spine. We incorporated a rain garden for a stormwater management system to act as a more calming area throughout the site that can be utilized in the winter for a small rink. Um, and there's also a water fountain. It's not pictured here on the slide, but um, this is where kids can play in the hot summer months. Um, and in terms of green space, uh, we incorporated a lot of that throughout the site and a network of green paths that kind of runs through the blocks. So <clears throat> this competition was during COVID. I think we were very deep in lockdown when we, when we were going through these designs. Um, and so the need for green space for one's well-being, especially in a downtown area, became very evident at this time. So uh, having a variety of green space and green path networks um, makes this a more livable space across different life stages for those living um, on site. And next slide. And then just going back to food security, um, during our initial research, one thing that became very apparent was the significance of the food deserts in the surrounding areas. So um, in the map on the left hand side of the slide with uh, the different red gradients, those are areas with low income census tracts where residents have more than 0.5 to one mile from the nearest supermarket. Um, however, one can also notice the significant amount of Kansas City community gardens that already exist in the space. And this is all, only a zoomed in map. When you zoom out, it's actually quite significant as well across the whole city. So this shows there's already a very strong community food network that's already in place. So for us, it was how can we build something that doesn't take away from this, but that provides a space to kind of connect into this. Um, so we incorporated an urban agricultural hub that has different facilities related to local food production and local food economy. Um, in terms of aging together, we thought that this could create um, access to healthier food options. This also increases interactions with community organizations that use the space. So this in turn creates a lot more awareness for residents living there, but also visitors to the site um, to kind of get awareness for this network that exists in the city. And then it also creates a lot of programming and job opportunities for different ages. Next slide. So we were very intentional in creating uh, mixed income housing and in different suite styles of supported people across age groups at different stages of life. Um, we wanted to make sure that as people age, they can still live within the area and aren't kind of pushed out. 
And so in the process, you kind of recognize that you might not always get the highest ROI on larger units, but ultimately livability is a really critical component to consider as part of the design process. You know, and ultimately we weren't looking to create these kind of small transient micro units that only appeal to a very specific demographic for a very limited period of time. Um, so in terms of site specifics, half of our GFA was for residential housing. And of that, as Francis uh, mentioned earlier, 30% of our units were affordable, targeted at 50% AMI, um, and the majority of the affordable units were larger. We were very explicit in ensuring that the affordable units were actually mixed in with the market units. Um, we didn't want to create buildings with certain stigma, and equity was a, a very critical consideration as part of the entire design process. Um, our site included both rental and home ownership, and the units uh, ranged from studio to four bed. Um, all the residential buildings were mixed use. They were aligned with necessity retail um, at grade with the goal of kind of working towards a, a 15 minute community where essentially everything you need is in a 15 minute walking radius. So things like a grocery store, bank, pharmacy, gym, restaurants. Um, but it was also really important to us to ensure that people who lived here also had access to the broader community, um, the broader, I guess, city and nearby communities through transit and active transportation. Uh, since this site really was situated so close to the downtown core. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we only had two weeks to complete this project. So there were many things that we didn't have a chance to fully explore that we would have looked into further um, had we had the time. Uh, a couple of those items were, you know, I guess like really diving into the concept of seniors housing. The term itself is quite two dimensional. There's obviously a lot of different seniors at different ages with different needs. So that's something that I feel like, you know, we could have flown out and explored um, in a bit more depth. We also would have uh, looked into how to incorporate access to services. So health and social services to ensure the residents in the development were well served. Um, and we also could have delved into a bit more detail on the unit layouts and how that would actually um, play out to make sure that those adhere to accessibility needs. Um, and something specific that we had touched on was winter programming. Um, and this was something that we kind of, we wanted to look into further, but just couldn't get it, didn't have the time to, but specifically how you create kind of a comfortable and positive winter experience for an aging population. Just noting from our own experience and parents and stuff, it can get really tough. Um, so we just wanted to close off with this rendering. Um, just shout out to Chenyi on our team, uh, who Francis introduced earlier, who developed these renderings and now working professionally, I recognize how insanely talented he is because this matches up to the stuff that I see um, produced by our architects <laughs> on a daily basis. So this over here is the uh, is the gateway community center that we'd spoken to as kind of the, the critical uh, social infrastructure of the site. Um, yeah, the competition, we, we were very lucky and, and grateful to have taken part in something like that and helped us to really dream of the development from scratch and consider all user experience um, from all different ages and just, I guess, really understand how somebody moves through and experiences a space in a way that we never really had. Um, and it was refreshing just to think of the perspective of all the different people and all ages and abilities um to create this kind of inclusive and connected community that resonated with the people who lived in kansas city uh, so it was a great learning experience and we were so happy to be able to share it uh, with you today so thanks so much again for having us um, and i guess happy to answer any questions now or maybe we go over to sam's presentation and do questions later victor i'll defer to you on that um i think we can go both presentations and then I'd have all the questions and answers at the end. Um, thank you, Leora and Francis, uh, for showing us your project. Um, I have to say also that uh, uh, they won the first prize once again, uh, because uh, part of, uh, um, part of uh, the, the main mission of their team was to look really into the demographic aspect of, the, of Kansas City. And again, that really resonated with the food aging in place, aging, um, multi-generational constituents and how you actually create a healthy society that you can rotate and move within one space without being uh, pushed to the peripheries of the city. So thank you. Uh, with that said, um, welcome Sam. I'll leave the, we'll leave the floor uh, to you.
Um, and you're muted, so. Okay, I'm just gonna pull up my PowerPoint. Um, just give me one second. I want to say a few words. I hope we can get some of the attendees' faces. It's always nice to present to people and not just names in black boxes. So just want to put this out there. <laughs> Sorry, just having. Um. Okay. Do I have the ability to share my screen? Yes. You should. Did you try? Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, there you go. Should be working. Great. Okay. Perfect. Um. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sam. Uh, and I've been working on my major research project over the past few months. Um, specifically, uh, it is called Beyond the Village, Identity, Kinship, Space and Place of Toronto's LGBTQIA2S Community. Um, and I've pulled a focus on aging specifically for this presentation. Um, so there, I kind of have a primer and then we'll go into some of what I have found about individuals aging. Um, so I have a small LGBTQ crash course, a little bit about the gayborhoods in Toronto and what they are, um, the problem, the purpose of my work, so far what I found, and then I'll talk a little bit about facilitating change. So um, crash course starts with the, the acronym. Um, the acronym that I chose to use was LGBTQIA2S+, and I've put what all of those letters mean here at the bottom. Um, there are a few other ac acronyms that people use. Um, I tried to just pick one that was all encompassing. Um, if I do this, are you still able to see it or is it half screen? Is it we still can see full all screen? Your, Sorry? We can see half screen with all the tabs of your computer. Okay. okay. Um, so I tried to choose the an acronym that encompassed the most that it could. So the acronym currently stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and questioning, intersex, asexual, two-spirited, and the plus is many more. Um, differences between sexuality and gender. So it's, there's kind of two parts to the LGBTQ community acronym. One is sexual orientation, which is the direction of somebody's sexual attraction. I think that is the one that most people know, talking about um, using the terms gay, straight, bi, pan. Um, those are how people generally identify. And then in terms of gender is where it gets a little more confusing, but it is the experience of being a man, a woman, or neither. Um, it's related to the social norms and expectations of what we have built in society. So if we're talking about gender identity, it's the an individual's experience of their gender and a person's sense of being as a woman, man, both or neither on the gender spectrum. Um, it could be the same as assigned at birth or different. Um, so we have the gender binary, which would be the um, where there are People are thought to either have one of two genders, a man, which corresponds with the birth sex of male, or woman corresponding with the birth sex of female. Um, cisgender is what that is. So you're cisgender if your sex aligns with the gender that you identify with. Beyond the binary is a little more confusing. We have quite a few ways that people identify that don't necessarily match the way that their uh, sex, that the sex that they were assigned at birth. So transgender is one that many people know. Um, there's also queer and gender nonconforming, non-binary, two-spirited, queer and intersex. 
Um, Two-spirited is specifically reserved for people who are indigenous and um, is a really specific way of identifying. But in terms of all the other ones, um, I, the most important thing to know is that everybody identifies differently. There are some very niche definitions, but every single person kind of picks one that they identify closest with. So it could mean something specific to them, um, but understanding that there is a binary and there is outside the binary. This is a little chart I found from the Trevor Project that kind of explains it a little bit further um, on a line uh, showing that people can lie anywhere on these spectrums. Uh, my project specifically starts by looking at defining neighborhoods and how a neighborhood is a place that emerged um, due to social and societal needs of comfort and community. Um, they really started showing up right after Stonewall and within Toronto after the bathhouse rates. Um, they are neighborhoods that are primarily LGBTQ individuals. So one of the well-known ones is in San Francisco, the Castro district. Specifically, when we're looking at Toronto, Toronto has the Church Wellesley Village, which um, emerged in the 70s. Um, there was, it's now well known as the gay village and is widely understood to be accepting of all LGBTQ identities. Um, but when we start to look at the history and what the community actually looks like today, it is a little different and there starts to become these gaps in knowledge. Um, so when you're looking at the history, uh, the first thing that I came to see was that it was based on homonormativity. So the village started by people starting to gather outside of this second cup. It was the first place that um, people could be visible in the LGBTQ community. And it was primarily dominated by uh, gay men and lesbian women who were white. So they really um, realized that by conforming to the, the normative standards of people who were straight and who were cis presenting, they were able to, to be open in public and be less marginalized. So when the village began to build itself, it began to tailor to these cisgender white gay men. Um, and a lot of people who didn't identify within that category were excluded. So anybody who wasn't middle class, who wasn't young, white um, and anybody outside of the gender binary was excluded from the building of the village and are still currently not represented. So when we look at what has happened because of the history, um, there's now this universal narrative that all members of the LGBTQ community are accepted and equally represented, um, which resulted in a lack of exploring the historical and current experiences of place and space. Uh, based on the experiences of, um, on the narrative experienced by white middle class cis gay men, uh, there's a lack of understanding of other intersecting elements of identity um, and experiences of marginalized people. So anybody who is outside of the white, the middle class, cisgender, gay, um, any other identities are really not talked about. And the third thing is that Understanding that even though stigma and discrimination is is a universal experience in the community, uh, it doesn't necessarily affect everybody in the same ways. And how the intersections of people's identities stand affects their marginalization and their experiences, which includes individuals who are aging. So LGBTQ seniors are marginalized because they are seniors, we don't know a lot of information about them. We don't know a lot of information about their needs. And that is because the current aging population is the first generation in Canada and also the US of openly LGBTQ individuals that are no longer marginalized by law, um, at least in Canada. In terms of uh, housing, there are structural and systemic factors such as identities, age, poverty, racism, and other factors that can impact older LGBTQ individuals' choices to, to live in a certain space or their housing needs. So my project looks at spaces and places in which individuals currently exist within the city of Toronto and the neighborhoods in which they reside, um, the housing typologies in which they live and the ways in which identity and kinship influence inhabitation of space and place. 
um, when I considered research, the first thing I did was look at um, any information that was out there in terms of literature and specifically in terms of housing and neighborhoods, it primarily focused on long-term care and in-home care. So from this national survey, overall is to understand that there are 36% of people reported having negative housing related experiences, part of the LGBTQ community. 48 weren't comfortable discussing their sexual orientation with housing staff or landlords, and 32 were not comfortable discussing gender identity, while 78% of Canadians want to age within their homes. Um, a lot of the discourse talked about how people were really uncomfortable with long term care. Um, they didn't feel safe disclosing their identity or being themselves. And there's also an affordability issue that is a long term, has a long term effect on the LGBTQ community. So a lot of people can't afford to go into care or retirement. Um, so when we're thinking about older care, especially for this community, we start questioning what that means. Um, so what I started looking at was different models. So I looked at um, aging in place. Uh, I looked at, um, and then in terms of aging in place, um, it seemed like a lot of people wanted to, and one of the main issues was isolation. Uh, so what I have done here is I looked at the information that I could find across the city. Um, I collected from this Facebook group uh, called Homes for Queers Toronto, um, where people share information about their housing that they have available and that they can share with other um, individuals if they have a space that's up for rent. I collected the information and mapped it. So there was only five people who were older, primarily because are older than the age of 50, primarily because it's on Facebook, I assume. But there's a lot of information that we can gain in terms of multi-generational housing and um, aging in place and co-housing from this. Um, so this map explores a lot. There are building types. Um, so we have condos, apartments, mixed use, mid-rise and houses. Uh, the number of residents per unit is represented by these number of, of dots. And then the monthly rent per person. So for example, if we're looking at this one here, there's three people living in this unit and then the monthly rent is between a thousand and closer to 1500 and they live in a house. So from this, from this, mapping uh i've learned that one a lot of the community is living together um and they're living in co-housing for many reasons one of them being experience of living with chosen family and kinship so wanting to have those relationships wanting to be able to build have community meals and having time spent together where you're getting groceries together or watching tv like a biological family would but it's with people that you choose um, which are really important members of LGBTQ's families or chosen family. Um, the other thing is uh, this resolves the issue of isolation that a lot of people are concerned about when they want to age in place. Um, they have the support needed from friends or people within their life living with them. Um, then the second thing is that living with these people is actually making their housing more affordable. So these lighter circles here were the rent of the entire unit if one person were to live alone. And then the smaller circle in the middle here is the rent that each of them are paying because they live together. Um, we also learned that uh, multi-generational housing is a really strong potential. There were a few examples, specifically one example in this area here. And then there was another example of here where um, there were two queer parents who had children but were also looking for another individual to live in their home and then the other one was to um, there was a straight couple who had a trans child who had moved out but they really wanted to share their home with the rest of the community so there's these opportunities for people who have biological connections to start building this multi-generational housing with people that they choose to be their family some who are even not part of the LGBT community, but are supportive, um, which is really interesting because that's not something that there's any research on and it's not something that I've never seen before. So when we start to understand the impacts of these sort of new forms of family, uh, you also start to realize that policy and bylaws are not facilitating this. Uh, as you can see, many people are living in 
houses here. They're living in apartment units within a house or renting a whole house. So beginning to think about the ways in which policy influences how we can facilitate and help individuals live in these situations would be the next step. So as I'm working on this project, I've realized that the community itself is adapting to the conditions to meet their needs. But specifically when we're talking about seniors and we're talking about the community as a whole, how can we hold the government accountable to make sure that there is this type of housing is when we start talking about setting affordable housing, um, making sure that multi-generational housing is facilitated if there's programs through the government where people can sign up because this is all happening on Facebook so a lot of seniors can't access it. Um, so that's where I'm going with the project and this is where I have been lately. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the parts that, uh, that I'm still working with Sam is uh, doing a study of a policy, a policy evaluation in the city, especially again about housing. Um, Sam is mentioning the concept of family. It's fluid. And when we see what the Toronto, City of Toronto names, uh, the way that they name this type of fabric, which is 70% of the city, they call it single family homes, right? So it's very hard to, uh, to renovate, subdivide, or create or houses that are, again, multi-generational, because in, in essence, they're only allowed to have certain type of community in it. Uh, that's why you see sometimes that you have five friends moving into one house, buying one house, because it's, uh, it's more affordable in that way than even going to a long-term care, as uh, Sam is mentioning. Um, the other part that is also... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, go ahead. And that's it. Uh, okay. <laughs> so anyways, I just wanted to say thank you, Sam, and thank you, Francis and Yora, for sharing all this information. Uh, thank you. Absolutely, Victor. I echo your words. Thank you very much for for the three of you for sharing your work. <clears throat> uh, I have um, it's it's a committee discussion, so please, people, uh, partake in the conversation. But I I have a comment to Sam because I think you hit it directly on what's absolutely needed. As some of us who work a lot in senior housing <clears throat> and affordable housing. Most units that are being developed part of the state and cities program right now are one bedrooms. And it's pretty much known that, oh, senior housing is all one bedroom with either studios because of the heterosexual norm of getting old, right? But as we, I was personally, and some of my teams here were developing senior housing, focusing on LGBT seniors, through some in interviews with people, we found out that there are some people who want to rent two bedrooms and are not interested in one bedroom because their chosen family, that roommate situation, is exactly what how they want to get old. So you, you, I love how you brought up that information through mapping this through the city of Toronto, which really further reinforces what we have heard from the senior as we were interviewing those seniors before building the project. <clears throat> we've capped it in our project as a two bedroom, but based on the data that I'm looking at, you have like three and four people living together. And sometimes that's a household. Yeah, thank you so much for your comments. It's, it's, it's been really interesting. Um, it's really not information that's tracked anywhere. It's not really looked into and, and the gap is huge. So having the, the idea with Victor to use this Facebook page to kind of facilitate and gather information is really interesting because this Facebook page exists across many cities have it. Um, it started to pop up across different cities and I think it's a really valuable resource into understanding what is happening and what, what we need to, to be doing because otherwise there's no nowhere to find this sort of information. I have a question for uh, Viora and, and Francis, 
I love finding out through when you were walking through the design that the senior center and the senior housing is right in the middle. It's the prime property, it's right there, it's the gateway, um, which is not the case most of the time. When there is a plan development like your, your project competition, plan developments usually tend to locate senior housing right on the fringes because they're the least, generate the least income, let's say, and they, people thought, think that they contribute the least to the, to the society, but as you've paired it with the community center, it's kind of created a hub. Can you tell me how you came to that conclusion or realization that that's, that's exactly in the center of that development that we want to put this in housing? Lira, I can go first and maybe you want to add anything if I miss it. Um, yeah, I think from the beginning, um, when we were talking about what we wanted on the site, I think the good thing about a design competition is we can say this is what we really want and we'll figure mm -hmm. out like how to make this work, um, right. which is maybe not always happening in reality. Um, but it worked out very well in terms of also the positioning of where it is with the underpasses, with the highway, um, conditions of the site near the major transit center and wanting it to be very representative of the site. So I think a lot of things came together and we really wanted it to, to be in that specific space. It, it kind of um, was always intentional, I think, from the beginning and how to plan around it uh, and even phasing. We included it in our first phase of development and construction and make sure kind of it establishes a presence from the beginning as well. Um, I don't know, Lior, if you have anything else to add to that. Um, the only thing I'll say is that just to build on the phasing idea so there was an existing senior site um that was already on the property so it was already in our mind that we that we wanted to make sure that that was included as part of the development and then we kind of thought about you know want to make sure these people aren't displaced we want to make sure that the development is phased in a way that there could be new seniors housing that's developed in advance of that of the demolition of that seniors home so it just became it was almost intuitive that we would do it earlier on in the development and then for a number of different, I guess, um, synergies that we spoke to earlier, just around the intergenerational programming, communal space. We didn't really want it to be a standalone building. We thought it made sense to try and integrate with an existing key feature of the development, which was the community center. So it actually just kind of came together nicely. Like, mm -hmm. I don't really remember even, like once we kind of decided to put it there, it was just, it was like perfect. We were just like, but we don't understand why this doesn't exist in more places. And then obviously once we found that, we saw a lot of examples where that exists more so in Europe than, uh, than in North America. Yeah. I was curious from the, from the west side of that site plan, what was the development to the west? Is that the downtown area? You've got the highway on the on the east side, and then what was on the west side? Yeah, the west side was more of the downtown core. It had different kind of specific districts, the entertainment district. There's a sports uh, stadium, like a baseball stadium, just to the to the bottom of the site. Hence, why also there was a lot of surface parking lots there um, to begin with. There was a library district. Um, Leor, maybe do you want to help me with the other ones? I think. There was also a lot more hotel developments happening in downtown. It was quite like a, a destination core, I think, the way it was currently being developed um, with a lot of condos going up. But um, yeah, there was still like a lot of space to the west of the downtown core. Uh, this um, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, just a couple of points. Uh, one is uh, I'd love to hear more about some of the precedents you looked at as you were investigating uh, the, the presentation or the, the design efforts uh, and the analysis um, and how far back might those precedents have gone? Probably not very far back. Um, and then looking forward, 
how, in addition to a, a venue like this, uh, how do you spread the word? How do you get it out there that what you're looking at perhaps is something new, uh, something that people need to pay attention to and take very seriously? I think some of the ideas you have are absolutely wonderful. I am hope to age at home, but we'll see. <laughs> That's a, it's a very dynamic living situation or arrangement that you or environment that you've created. Uh, and I think for everybody, and I think it's, um, it's, would like to find out more how you got there in terms of uh, not just your ideas, but what you saw uh, uh, as precedent and then how much you spread the word. Sure, I can, I can kind of start. So I wish, um, David, that these precedents were more top of mind for us. We did this uh, design competition we were in 2021. So it was a, a little while back, um, like April of last year. Um, so I don't remember like specific names or architects involved, um, but there were just some, I, like, I guess I can kind of just speak to what we pulled away from these precedents. And I think a lot of it was just the kind of communal living that we don't necessarily experience here. Um, or Francis and I hadn't had exposure to in Toronto. Um, we also just saw like a lot of, you know, very pedestrian oriented environments, um, things that really made really great use of public space in a way that I guess in Toronto can be limited with our seasonality and things aren't always taken advantage of in the winter months. So that was like a really big focus. Um, in terms of moving this forward, I think that that's something I can speak to a little bit more thoughtfully, just because I now work in the development industry um, since graduating. I gave like a presentation to my team once I started on, you know, the, the, the design presentation that we'd put together and and how we can kind of think about some of the principles um, that we had, you know, created in this hypothetical world, how we actually pull them into what the kind of work that we're doing in, in Toronto. And um, we've had, you know, a number of conversations about being more aspirational, right, in like the early visioning stages of master plan developments, which are honestly fewer and far between in a city like Toronto, where there's so much development and the parts will seem to get smaller and smaller each time. But I think that um, it's, it's just continuing to have those conversations and just flagging, you know, the, these learnings throughout the process. So like one example um, I can raise is just around like unit types. I've, I feel like there's like this crazy migration towards like smaller units and micro units and creating these spaces that it seems to be super transient, not livable and not really um, great to, to age in or age together. And so just flagging those kind of experiences as you start development where it seems like, okay, let's be efficient. Okay, well, maybe there's more than efficiency that should be brought up in, in this kind of uh, conversation. So I think that, uh, you know, we'll have to do make a concerted effort to bring these types of principles up as we move forward in future developments, but hopefully that comes from the development side, the architects and all the different kind of consultants and parties that are working towards actually bringing these developments to life. Well, thank you. That's that's interesting. The uh, in terms of precedent, also, it's is it, and I don't know the I don't know much about this, but just speculating, uh, just looking at the way uh, people used to live, um, say before a hundred years ago. I mean, families lived together, families died together under the same roof, and in a sense, we were kind of generations are siloed, uh, and it's sort of it's a is it a what sort of a social history living together history is there that, um, and maybe you've looked into this, but is there that uh, can be informative and in, in trying to figure out, gee, how, how can we improve all of this and bring people back together uh, in a more humane way? Both your project, David, absolutely. Both, both these projects really have uh, addressed urban and city environments that and, and have showcased as a resource to local governments. Uh, to, to me, I see this, both of these exercises and research are a resource for local governments, whether it's Kansas City or Toronto. Has this been put out there? Have any of the elected officials, uh, mayors, representative uh, looked at the mapping data that Sam has been doing or the uh, intentional intergenerational community that Francis and Leora have put, put, put in that master plan. 
you want to go ahead first, Sam, or? No, you can go talk. Oh, okay. Um, uh, we were um, lucky enough to be invited to speak in Kansas City virtually after we won the competition. I think it was Kansas City Connect. It's mm -hmm. kind of a group of architects, designers that uh, work in the city itself. Um, and we got a lot of positive reception from it, which was, um, which was really great to hear, especially in a competition when you never saw it physically there, mm -hmm. when you're all doing it virtually. Um, I, for the site itself, I, for ours, there was always a, not a competition, that's not the right word, but it was either doing this type of development or a baseball stadium or something that was very much being pushed for in Kansas City, um, which I think that still is going on. I think there may actually be the baseball stadium potentially going up. Um, on that site. I yes. Think, yes. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't think our, our design, hoping to influence potentially other areas or yeah. specific parts of it. But um, uh, yeah, we are lucky to still be able to speak and uh, to people working in Kansas City as well. Yeah. The word was also put in place, I remember from uh, this uh, ULI podcast uh, uh, that is still available. I think I can send the link. Um, and uh, it was another conference, not a conference, a talk for ULI as well, uh, a couple, a year and a half ago, where city officials were there actually from Toronto listening to the presentation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we were invited to the city of Toronto yeah. to speak to their strategic planning unit. So that's exactly. Great. Yeah. Right. Sam, that information um, that you gave, like you said, that's probably not out there anywhere, is it? That was a great culmination of information. Um, and Leora, once you said you were working with the development company, then I, I'll pose this question. What's the um, affordability percentage uh, requirement in Toronto, do you know? So there's new regulation that was just introduced in Toronto um, under inclusionary zoning. So that's kind of the now mandated percentage. It hasn't fully come, uh, it, it's like gonna be, I guess like enacted as of September 18th of this year. It is a, kind of like staggered range it's not across the board there's like transition policy that it'll increase year over year and it yeah. differs between affordable ownership affordable rental and um condo and purpose-built rental i literally have a chart in front of me but it'll essentially get as high as i think 10 it's, start, it's starting off around the 10 percent mark um for condo starting zero percent for rental just i guess to make sure that it's not cutting off um, incentives to build purpose-built rental, which is a little bit, I think, less, um, it's, it's a bit harder to build in Toronto than it is in the U.S., based on my understanding, and I'll increase to as high as 16, um, I think around, yeah, the 20% mark, and then purpose-built rental will be 5%. So yeah, it's like this whole staggered chart, but that's kind of like the, the, var the variation in the climb over the next, I guess, five to 10 years. Yeah, that's, low so i'm glad to see that you were trying aiming for the 30 percent yeah it's definitely it's definitely not um it's not I, I there was like a lot of i think resistance in the community not resistance but just like a bit of surprise that that was that those were the percentage that were landed on but i think a lot of it was just making sure that it wasn't going to stifle development and making sure that it was transitioned in um, and then the, hopefully the percentages increase I guess uh, year over year yeah that's good if it was a pri private developer would he have to be would it work better with a um, I don't know city what am I getting at uh, can't private developers get around the uh, affordability percentage somehow sometimes because the town is offering them or the city's offering them an alternative, or am I wrong? In, Philip, Philip, do you know? Yeah, that? in, in Boston, that? sometimes, uh, depending on neighborhoods, if developers can show that it's not suitable or feasible to keep the affordable units on site, they would pay for high dollars to offset those units to another neighborhood. 
Yeah. This doesn't have with this this doesn't have with help with integration. No. At all, and it's not the preferred method. But there are has been some higher end neighborhoods in Boston where affordable housing is not integrated in the larger developments. Unfortunately, I don't know if there's something like this in Toronto. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice yeah. if that policy could be written or the you know, regulations could be written so that they can't get away with that? Correct. Yes. Thanks. Those great present yeah. presentations. Yeah. Any other questions for for the teams? Uh, or for Sam or for Leora, for Francis? I want to echo one word that I think Leora you said. So you will use the word intentional, and I think that is exactly what uh, makes your projects, both of them, uh, very important because it's you guys at the educational level you're starting to think about how we can make housing intentionally inclusive, intentionally affordable. Uh, which is a great start for, for you guys, your colleagues, to be able to learn those social principles of how we can start from the beginning, from a next generation changing society. Housing is not just housing. Housing, location, um, size, affordability, mm -hmm. all these matter in forming the urban environment. And uh, it's really nice to see that a major university is investing in studios like these and supporting students to, to inquire. And I share your frustration about the lack of maybe precedence or data or enough things uh, to, to base yourself on because these are areas that are very understudied for generations. So thanks for pushing the envelope a little bit more towards the mainstream for people to think about LGBTQ housing, senior housing, intergenerational. I think it's, it's an important topic. Uh, I always tell my students, we, we are in these boats uh, and everyone needs a place, again, that it's inclusive uh, in a sense that uh, this is for everyone, not for a certain percentage, uh, or the ones that can afford it, or the ones that are uh, conform to cer certain uh, heteronormative standards, right? In the case, for example, of Toronto, which I find that it's uh, similar to here, uh, which Sam has touched upon, is that, again, the cities, almost like 70%, again, are houses, right? Um, so the new fabric that is being created is, it's not enough, well, one, not enough housing for the number of people living there, but also not enough adequate housing for the aging populations, for not even young populations or uh, older adults population. They're just like minuscule apartments uh, in these towers that, uh, that do not offer the proper amenities, right? And then um, Sam is touching on that. It's like, what kind of urban environments should we create? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, social bonding and relationships should we look at, right? And how can we provide something that it's uh, that it's uh, that is it, it, that is important for for everyone? And Leora, the, what I love is like, again the creation of all these open spaces and uh, uh, community centers and gardens that bring people together. Because as they mentioned in Toronto, something that uh, not a lot of open space, like good quality space that brings people together. It's something that it's uh, that it's uh, that we are missing, right? It's a typical uh, little um, park with a couple of swings and two benches, right? And a patch of long uh, of grass. But what else can we offer, right? What other amenities can you put in a city that's that are actually uh, socially rooted? It's it's very important. It's actually, Victor, you mentioned it's it's those neighborhood-based amenities, parks, housing, 
that I think a lot of our cities are missing. It's those little little impromptu spaces. Right. We have we have sparks. They end up in the nicer neighborhoods sometimes, yeah. or or gated because of safety. Right. I visited Atlanta most recently. The major park in the middle of the city is gated. They close it at night. There's police everywhere for safety. This is all questionable. But it's the little small parks in neighborhoods for people to gather and meet. It's the community housing where the seniors could live and stay in their neighborhoods is what I think our cities are missing. We have bigger developments, but it's the neighborhood based amenities that uh, we, we would love to see more here yeah. in, in Boston. And it seems like it's the same case in Toronto. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't know if things are bylaws that's a, and a policy that needs to be changed. And it takes uh, quite a long time. But uh, I always tell also the students, is saying, we look at these cities as, let's say, like the little towns in Europe, right? or the Netherlands, right? Where it's very well integrated. We love all these things, but once we try to implement them, we have all these bylaws that make them impossible, but everyone loves them still. So how can we create something that's, uh, that speaks towards that? Uh, and uh, we can make laws that are flexible as well to create these projects. Correct. We are close to the end, I just want to see if there's any closing remarks, questions before we. Do you have any questions for us, the three of you? Okay. Yeah. Well, th thank you very much uh, for joining us, Leora, Sam, and, and uh, Francis. And thanks, Victor, for uh, bringing the students together and, and supporting all their work. Route. And I know your work also focuses on that. Uh, thank you. There's a, yeah. there's a comment from Drake in the chat. The current housing crisis is exacerbated by zoning. This is true virtually everywhere in the US. If every community accommodated an additional 5%, the needs discussed here could be better addressed. Yes. Exactly. I would say more than 5%, <laughs> more let's than be more five. aggressive, <laughs> let's put in 10 or 15%. We need more yeah. affordable housing and senior housing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want to say thank you to the students because I have been working a lot on these projects. Sam is still working on, on this project and we're pushing it. Uh, in the Ora and in Francis, I am always very happy to see, um, again, this uh, ULI project and how you pushed it. Uh, so much. So thank you. Uh, and thank you to, the, to, to you, Philip, for inviting us uh, to, uh, to show this, uh, these projects to everyone today. My, my pleasure. I get very excited <laughs> when there is yeah. students who are starting to think from the beginning about integration and senior housing yeah. and things yeah. that I didn't get the chance to do and study yeah. when I was in school. So thank you, everybody, awesome. for joining us. We will be meeting again the, sec the third Tuesday in July at 515 for a new subject. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Okay, right. have a good yeah. night. And yes, the, but I say another comment. Yes, it was done in two and a half weeks <laughs> in, last, uh, in 2021. It was, uh, it was more like a sprint, not a marathon. Okay. Uh, anyways, sure. thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.